Well, good morning. This is the awake service. I said good morning last service, and I, it was bad, wasn't it? I mean, there were just almost as many people. Well, I think as many people in last service, and they were like, uh, uh, are you charging your phone during church? You really are. That's hilarious. She hates to be pointed out. It's better than your husband who eats a bag of chips in the front row during church. And yeah, well, you're almost as bad. It's all right. You got to keep your blood sugar up. It's all good. So it's good to see you guys today. God keeps his promises. Uh, Listen, if you don't hear anything else, can I just say that God keeps his promises? And, you know, the message I'm going to talk about today is so easy when your life is going well. And so hard when it's not. And so, and so what I want you to do is if, if you've got some things in life that are bothering you right now, um, during this sermon, I just want you to continually place them at God's feet. And uh, we'll talk about what that means. But we have made it through the entire book of Mark this year. And um, you guys have done great. And so um, it really, uh, every week has been different and challenging and exciting. And uh, this week, the best news of all, listen, you, we would not be a church if not for the resurrection. The resurrection is the most important, pivotal thing. The reason that we have a cross, the cross is everywhere, um, with no one on it is because Jesus is not on the cross. He's not dead. We do this to show that he's alive. And truthfully, many theologians have argued that maybe the tomb should be the sign of the church, but we couldn't figure out. People would wonder why you're wearing a circle on your lapel, I guess. So, um, But the cross is such an awesome representation of what Jesus did for us. Listen to what it says here in 1 Peter 4.13, but be happy that you are sharing in Christ's sufferings so that you will be happy and full of joy when Christ comes again in glory. And here's what this means. When life is not perfect, when life is a struggle... When things don't go well, those are the moments when we realize this is not heaven. And any time that we start to think that this is heaven, we have those moments in life that suddenly hit us in the face where we realize, you know, the doctor said this and we go, what? Or something happens to somebody we love and we think, what? Or a situation happens between people or... Something happens at work, or your car breaks down. It doesn't have to be something big. Isn't it funny? The little things sometimes are the things that frustrate us the most. I've always said, we, I do pretty well at tests. I fail pop quizzes all the time. You know, something big happens, and boy, I take it right to the Lord in prayer. Somebody cuts me off in traffic, and I'm not talking to Jesus, right? <laughs> so, right? And, and, and so it's, the, it's important that we learn to surrender those things. Now, I want to tell you a story about Shannon... And Stephanie. Shannon and Stephanie were two sisters that were in my first youth group at Central Baptist in Melbourne. And uh, uh, I did, I got to do Shannon's wedding first, largest wedding I had ever done, maybe one of the largest weddings that I've done. It's got to be one of the largest. I don't know that it's the largest, but there were, I don't know, 900, 1,000 people at her wedding. Yeah, I told you it was big. What do you think I was lying? Is it? Um, and I have done. I was trying to do some math, 25 years of weddings. Uh, uh, sometimes, I, there's times I had two in a day. Um, the most I've ever had is two weddings and a funeral in a day, which sounds like a movie, doesn't it? Um, but uh, I know it's got to be hundreds and hundreds of weddings that I've done. And so what I do, I typically meet with couples before the wedding. So I did uh, Shannon's wedding. Now, I could not say this on video, but I will say it here. Just to give you an idea of Shannon's wedding, there was an officer stationed at the back of her wedding. Um, her mom uh, uh, had an issue happening, and the policeman came to me and said, would you uh, uh, be willing to wear a bulletproof vest? That's an awesome wedding, huh? And... Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, why? And they told me why. And then I said, is the bride wearing a bulletproof vest? To which he said, no. I said, well, then I'm not wearing a bulletproof vest. Now, if the bride wears a bulletproof vest, I should have said, is the groom? Because if the groom was, I don't really know. Did he plan on stepping in front of us? I'm not sure. So that was her wedding, just to give you a try. So, so then I meet with Stephanie and her husband-to-be. She called me. It was probably two, three, four years later. And she said, Eric, we'd love you to do our wedding. And I said, I'd love to be a part of your wedding. 
And as I met with them, uh, and I do this with every couple, I talk to them about what happens on wedding days. And brides typically, uh, for the most part, freak out uh, all the way up until the wedding. I, I'm just being nice. It's, grooms typically have no idea there's a wedding. Um, right? For most people, right? It's like, oh, was there a wedding? I, I mean, we go buy used clothes and borrow them from somebody for our wedding. And you go buy a dress and we borrow borrow a used, think about that. Anyway, okay, so, so anyway, so when I meet with a couple, here's what I tell them all the time. I say, listen, on your wedding day, not everything will go well. I said, there'll be something. I said, whether it's a, a groomsman's shoes, somebody didn't pick up their tux, somebody's dress didn't fit, somebody's shoes. I've had zippers break right before they come down the aisle. That's exciting. Lots of shawls. So you need to always bring a shawl to a wedding. You will be the savior of the world. And uh, uh, so I've seen everything. I've seen people late to their weddings, um, all kind of stuff, and um, car accidents. So I said to her, I said, listen, things can go wrong, but you need to not make that thing the focus of your wedding day. I said, on your wedding day, you know, husband, you focus on her, and, and I'll be talking to you, so it'll be me, you, and God. I said, that's really the focus. What happens to the rest of the event is just part of it. I said, but the truth is, this is what matters, and I want you to enjoy your wedding day. And so that's advice I've given for years and years. On Stephanie's wedding day, she once again had a large wedding, not quite as big as her sister's, but there were hundreds and hundreds of people there, and they had rented this amazing venue. And they had this cake that was gigantic. It was, it was tears on the side with fountains in the middle and bridges between the top of, and a you know Barbie and Ken looking thing at the top made a ceramic that they will leave somewhere in a cupboard for 30 years, right? I'm just saying. So the wedding day comes and I walk in to where they're going to have the reception and there's the cake, gigantic, beautiful, but something's not quite right. The cake is on a table shoved against the wall, and it looks like the leaning tower of cake. It is not all together. It's kind of been pieced back together. You can tell the cake had fallen apart and was everywhere. And here's these beautiful fountains with a cake that looks like it had gone through a washing machine. And I went, and I always pray with the bride, so I went to pray with the bride, and she said, did you see the cake? And I thought, she's on Xanax, but she wasn't. <laughs> she said... She said, the driver got in an accident on the way here and destroyed the cake. But you said something would happen. So I'm glad it was the cake, which I thought, well, I didn't mean the cake. That's a pretty big deal. I, I didn't say that. So we go through the way. She's happy. By the way, by the way, when you do a wedding, can, can I just be honest with you? Okay, listen to me. Listen to me. Tell your young people this. Young people, listen. People don't care about your cake. They, you don't have to get the best baker in the world. They're going to eat it in 12 seconds, and then they're going to say, can we leave now? So, I'm, okay. This is hundreds of weddings talking to you here. I've had every kind of chicken and beef there is. Now, here's what's awesome. A few, <laughs> did I say all that out loud? <laughs> Some of that was meant, Mike said to me last night, he said, you say a lot of things out loud that you shouldn't. I'm like, yeah, I know. So, <laughs> something like that. So, <laughs> so um, she, comes, she calls me a few weeks later. She said, Eric, it's wonderful what happened with the cake. And I'm thinking, mmm. she said, they not only refunded our money, but they gave us a credit. We can have another party now with the money we had from the cake. You were right. It all works out. And I never told her it all worked out. I just. <laughs> but she said how wonderful it was. And she was so glad that I told her not to get focused on the one thing. Your life always has at least one thing. Always. And if you're not careful, you will miss your life worrying about the one thing. There's always one thing. Now, sometimes the one thing is gigantic. I'm not, I'm not negating what you're telling me is big. But if you focus on that one thing, you will miss all of the people. If you focus on that one thing, you will miss enjoying and loving and encouraging and all the things that go along with life because you'll be focused on the one. And there's always another. Even in this story, they fix one thing and they wonder about a second thing. So here we go. 
Oh, here's the three things we're going to talk about today. We worry, God works, and then He calls us to tell others. Here we go. Number one, we worry about the future. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, that's just fun to say, it looks like salami if you say it wrong, all right? Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Now, Jesus had already had um, probably aloe. Um, most people think it was about 60 pounds of aloe was already put on him. Um, something along those lines, which would have started. Um, and they didn't really, the Jews did not really do, uh, uh, it wasn't like the Egyptians where they did a, a formal thing. But, but these women wanted to come. And so they brought, very early, so they brought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. So they were headed to the tomb early in the morning. So very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise. By the way, this is the reason we have church on Sundays. We have church on Sundays because it's about the resurrection. From the very early in the church, it was called the Lord's Day. And, and so very early in the church, they began to change when they had worship to Sunday, knowing that it was the day the Lord rose again. It's to remind us of that. That's the reason we put crosses on the wall. Even though, listen, many churches only talk about the cross on Easter and only talk about the resurrection on Easter. We, we really should be part of our lives. And so he continues early, at just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? What happened? They had already gotten focused on what needed to be fixed. How are we going to do this? How are we going to take care of it? See, many times we worry about things that God's already planning and working at taking care of. How many of you have ever woken up in the middle of the night and you didn't think you were worried, but you woke up worried? Anybody ever do that one? I do that one all the time. Did you know that? Your pastor thinks he's trusting God, and then he goes to sleep. And about 1.30, this, all the squirrels decide it's time for a meeting. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. And so we have a meeting about the thing I said, usually. Or the thing that's coming up next. Or the issue with this child. Or the struggle with this person. Or man, I hope so and so is going to be okay. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now here's what I want you to focus on here. The word present. Because we're, we're coming up to a time where we give presents, right? So if I give you a present, if I give Carrie a present today, and I gave him a little box, and it was a present, and I said, Carrie, here's your present, thank you so much. And, then, and he said, oh, I really like it, and I grabbed it and walked away with it. He'd be like, what? In the, I thought you said it was a present. Now this is the word present, but it's just the same as present. Present your request to God. What does that mean? Leave them there. Leave them there. But I'll be honest with you. When we worry, what do we do? We take the present back. Listen, when you do that, guess what? Go back and leave it. And then listen. Listen to what's next. When you feel like what Steve's talking about, where you just feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, I want to encourage you, move to the next step. What's the next step? With thanksgiving. God, thank you that you're going to take care of that. God, thank you for what you've done in the past. God, thank you for making me, helping me make it this far. God, thank you that all those things I worried about last week never came to be. And the new worries that are coming probably will never come to be. But even if they do, you're going to be with me to walk me through the difficulty. I am not looking forward to this afternoon. Because sometime this afternoon... I will be headed out into my garage. Because here's what I did earlier in the week. I got a new battery for one of my drills. I was so excited I got the new battery. But it needed another plug, so I moved my plugs around. And in doing that, I accidentally unplugged the freezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You been there? Thank you for your sympathy. By loud moaning. That was perfect. Whoa, whoa. I don't think that's the loudest moaning we've ever... Whoa. So, it was apparently last Saturday I did this. So, about last Tuesday, I said, I think there's something dead in our garage. I think there's a rat. I started looking around the garage for a rat or something. I thought, something has crawled in our garage and died. Couldn't find anything. So, I thought, maybe it's the sink. So, I poured some bleach in the sink and washed it out. <laughs> Smells better. Went back inside. 
Day later, still smells out there. One of you kids leave something out? You know, you got to blame your kids, right? I looked in garbage bag. You know, there's all kinds of things. Looking around, I don't see anything. About three days later, I looked over at the freezer. I thought, huh, it's plugged in. So apparently I plugged it into a plug that didn't work. I pulled open the freezer. I found it. (laughs) Just to let you know, my sister Kelly recently bought a house with a freezer that probably smelled like she threw it away. She, get, she put it on the curb. Somebody else took it. Now, I have made the mistake before. When my roommate moved out of my dorm and moved into his own place, I went and helped him clean out the fridge. I was a college student. I used pine saw. He still tastes pine saw to this day because I don't, don't ever clean your fridge with pine saw, ever, ever. I think he twitches once in a while when you say pine saw. He, that's been almost... 30 years ago, and he still reminds me that I was the one that cleaned his refrigerator out with pine salt. But I'll go out there, and I'll clean it out. Can I tell you what's going through my mind? Oh, gosh, I don't want to. How am I going to? What? It, oh. Listen, we've all got things we can worry about, that, and some things we have to deal with. These women, as they went, can you imagine what they thought they were going to find? And yet God had already taken care of it. He had not only taken care of the stone, he had taken care of Jesus. He had risen again. It's the whole reason we're here today is that Jesus rose. So let me tell you something. You can trust him with your future. We think God's surprised. You ready? I'm going to freak you out. God knew about coronavirus. Now, I'm not saying that means that you don't need to be prepared. God knows about storms that are coming, and we're Floridians. We board our houses up, whether we need to or not. We just want to help Home Depot, right? So we board up our houses and we buy milk and bread. I never figured that one out. And toilet paper, yeah, well, that's new, right? And so coronavirus, same way we, you know, God knows. You ready for this? God knows about the election already. And you're worried about it. He knows already. He's known every president in the past that people worked about, worried about, and everything. He, he, Revelation's already written. Have you noticed? It's in the Bible there. So sometimes we just have to say, God, I can't do anything about this, but I trust you. Can you trust him with the future? Number two, God works suddenly. But when they looked up, I'm going to come back to that. They saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. By the way, what they may or may not have known was there was a a stamp put on there. There were guards stationed out there. Those guards had already been so freaked out by seeing angels, they passed out and then took off. They they probably didn't know that part of the story at this point. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Yeah, I'm guessing. By the way, I've talked about how I wonder if angels are like Italians. I don't mean this to be disrespectful at all, but I just think of Italian mafia being the ones who protect people, who wipe people out, and work for God the Father. So I always imagine when I get to heaven, angels are going to come to me and my friend Dino and say, you guys remember that one thing you did? We had to protect you. I scraped my wing right here. Come here. I want to talk to you for a minute about your life. So he says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. And listen to what he says, exclamation point. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? By the way, no, there is no argument that Jesus was not in the tomb. The guards made up a story that he was stolen. But there was never an argument that Jesus was alive here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter. I love that. Peter's the one that denied Jesus publicly. He's the one that that night, Jesus actually looked at him when he denied him. That's one thing we miss sometimes in Scripture, is he, Jesus actually looked at him at that point. I don't know if he was walking through. We don't know exactly how that worked. But Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine how you would feel? I mean, I don't know if you've ever been talking bad about somebody and had them walk up on you. But imagine Peter grieving not only Jesus' death, but grieving his response 
And the angel says, go tell the disciples and Peter. And by the way, we know that Peter chipped into this story. So we know that he also made sure that it was mentioned here. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, what's the key to this whole passage? They looked up. They were worried. They were thinking, what are we going to do? This is the task we have to do. This is the next thing. By the way, in life, don't we just get busy with our tasks? We got the next thing we got to do. We got the next thing we have to accomplish. And you know what they did? They looked up and they saw the answer. Can I tell you when you're struggling with something, quit looking down and look up. God, I want to present this request to you. God, help me to deal with this. Because here's the deal. When you're always looking down, you can't love the people next to you. You begin walking in frustration and sadness. Listen, stress will not kill you. Your reaction to stress will kill you. How we respond to it. Romans 8, 28 says this. We know in all things God works for the good for those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Now, number one, it does not say that everything that happens in your life is good. Evil people can hurt you. We live in a world with free will. That's, that's why I was asked to wear a bulletproof vest to a wedding. Right? People can hurt you. But God can work it out to the good if we love him, number one. And number two, we live according to his purpose. God, what do you want me to do? So we have to spend time in God's word. We have to spend time in prayer. We have to confess our sins where we mess up and blow it and say, God, forgive me for that. Help me to walk in you. We have to look up. God, help me to keep my eyes on you. We walk in worry. Years ago, there was a movie called Last Holiday. I don't know if you ever saw it. I think it's Queen Latifah. Is that who's in that? And she's told that she has, I think, three weeks to live. And so she goes and sells everything, gets rid of everything she has up her house. She, she trades in all her lifetime stuff. And she decides to take the vacation of a lifetime. She goes where she wanted to go. She does what she wanted to do. But that's not the big part of the movie. Here's the big part of the movie. She, she quit worrying about everything. She quit worrying about what people thought about her. She quit worrying about all the things she did. She just did what's right. And what's amazing is, if you watch it, she actually was better at loving and caring about people around her because she didn't worry so much about it. And then, of course, near the end of the movie, she finds out she wasn't really sick to begin with. Here's the truth about your life. You're worried about things God's already put on the path for you, and he's going to take care of it. And guess what? If the worst thing you have to worry about is that you're dying, that's also the best news you've ever had. Because if you're a Christian, that means one day you'll go to sleep here and you'll wake up in heaven in his presence. What a great day that will be. Are you love him? Do you live according to his purpose? So trust that he is working. Even in the things you don't like. God, I trust that you're working. I don't like this one part, but I trust that you're working. By the way, one of the things that's really weird about me, I mean, there's lots of things I'll tell you, there's a list, but is that even when something's going wrong, I try to ask God, God, show me what's good about even this dumb thing. I remember getting to pray with my doctors when I was in the hospital. I said, God, thanks that I can pray for my doctors. Wasn't a whole lot else I could be. <laughs> I was sick. But I could be thankful. So what can you be thankful for? What can you lift up to him? What can you say to him? God, I know you're going to work this out. I don't know how, but I trust you to work it out. And then finally, we need to trust him. The future. Trust that he's working. Number three, we're called to tell others. I told this story in first service. I'm going to tell it in this service, even though the person's here. There's a guy that goes here to church. The life was going great. And one day, one of his friends just challenged him, asked him some questions about life and living. One of his friends that was a Christian. And he said, you know, you really thought about your life. And so this friend didn't really say much to his other friend, but he began thinking about it. And he decided to go to a church service. And at that church service was a guest speaker. And that night, this person gave their life to Christ. Their life was changed for eternity. Why? Because somebody looked up, saw their friend and said, you know what? Life isn't just about me. I'm going to talk to them. When's the last time you talked to somebody about your faith? 
You talked to somebody about what God's doing in your life. You shared with somebody. Because here's the truth for some of us. The reason sometimes we get so caught up in our problems and situations and worried about the world is because we've not taken time to share with anybody. The good that God's done. To look for those opportunities. I'll never forget being in the hospital with my mom. My mom, after open heart surgery, the day after, barely awake, seeing one of the ladies walk in who had a tear rolling down her cheek, and my mom said, can I pray for you? How often do we go through life worried about our own problems, but we don't take time to look to the needs of others? By the way, in your Bible, it probably says, uh, after, I think it's verse uh, 8, the originals ended there. But within about 40 to 80 years, we know that this little extra ending was added, uh, probably from other scriptures, maybe from other eyewitnesses. But because of what it says, it aligns with scripture, and we also feel like this is ordained also. Here's what it says. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them. We know that story from another passage, right? Walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they didn't believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Remember? Look at my nail marks. See the pierce in my side? We know that story too. And then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creations. Creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. You know what I got to see last night? Not just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people come on our campus from all different walks of life. I got to see family members from our church smile and encourage others. Go out of their way to be a blessing. Our members build games and do things and get here early and and try to make an environment where people could be pointed towards Jesus because of our love for them. And I didn't see anybody go home sad. People sacrifice their own time, their own attention. In some cases, their own muscle aches and pains. I had several people tell me this morning, I'm so sore. Sore for Jesus. (laughs) My back hurts for Jesus, right? And what happens when we love people? They get to see God's grace. I mean, we can share the gospel with them. Gospel just means good news. It doesn't necessarily mean the whole thing. It just means good news. The real good news is that Jesus died and rose again. And so when you and I are tired of living the way we live and we surrender, we say, I'm a sinner. (laughs) I've never argued with anybody about that one. I'm a sinner and I need God's grace. And when we surrender to him and say, Jesus, take my sin. I want to follow you the rest of my life. The Bible says that that great exchange, because of his death and resurrection, that great exchange takes place and he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. So finally, I want to encourage you. Trust that he can use you to bless others. Just like I have a great friend now who's a Christian, how God put all those things in place by one person. And other people, I'm sure, too. But one person just sharing. Know that you can make a difference in the lives of others. By the things that you do. By the ways that you love. And let me tell you. When you take your request and present them to God. Then it frees you up. To love other people. If you're here today and you want to have a relationship with Christ and you don't. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're here today and there's a burden that you just need to lay at his feet. I want you, if you've got to do it over and over, it's okay. Imagine laying at his feet and then begin to give him thanks. Think of how he's going to help you through that, but also thank him for what he's done in the past. And you will find that you will begin to look up. And it will change how you treat the people around you. It will change how you respond. And God's spirit, that peace that passes understanding, will take you over. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that everything that I said pointed us to your word, to your resurrection, to the belief that we have that you died and rose again because God sent Jesus because you love us. Father, thank you. Lord, we thank you for helping us make it through rough times. 
We thank you for helping us walk through difficulties and pain and struggle. Lord, knowing that this isn't heaven, but also knowing that no matter where we go, you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their heart to you, whether it's through a prayer or just an earnest prayer from the heart of saying that they need you. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.